All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Baitlick, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's flight with Doug Burks. Um, I'm I have a made up title at Corelight, which is strategist. And it just means I guess to work on interesting projects involving network security monitoring. And part of that is uh, being involved with cool people like Doug. And uh, Doug, I, I was going back through my email trying to figure out if I could if I could determine exactly when we first may have spoken. But I, had, I do have a firm date about when I first became aware of Security Onion. And I know I didn't use Security Onion in, in a class without talking to you first. So I found an email from December, uh, or actually it's a blog post of December of 2010, where I was talking about being so pleased I had just integrated Security Onion into the next version of TCPIP Weapons School, which I had previously taught using FreeBSD VMs that I built myself. But then I came across Security Onion and I thought, this is so amazing. Uh, I'm just going to use this because it's open source, it's supported, um, it, it's, it works so so well. And uh, I think I, I asked you, hey, do you mind if I use it in a class? And you said, of course, that's what it's out there for. And uh, from then on, we've we've uh, known each other and even worked together. And and now you are, and have been for several years now, the CEO of, of Security Onion Solutions, which is the uh, commercial arm of Security Onion. Uh, but you continue to uh, produce, in my opinion, what is the most uh, uh, well-integrated, well-supported, well-documented um, open source security solution that's out there. And uh, that's why we're interested in having you be on the show today with, uh, with the Zeek community, because if you use Security Onion, you're using Zeek. It's, it's there uh, integrated with the other NSM tools. Well, that's, uh, that's an awesome introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's a, a privilege and honor to be here. And, you know, when you were talking about um, back in the day when you approached me about using Security Onion in, in your class, um, I, I remember that moment in time very vividly because uh, you had always been kind of a, a hero and role model. And, you know, so for you to reach out to me and ask for permission to use Security Onion in your class, uh, how could I say no to that? You know, uh, that was kind of a, a dream come true. So, you know, I, I appreciate uh, all of your support throughout the years and certainly your leadership in the network security monitoring community. Uh, and you've certainly been a very influential part of, of my life and uh, many other folks' lives as well. So thank you all. Thank you for everything that you've done for really the entire community. Well, thanks. Thanks, Doug. And, and uh, same to you. And, and I don't know if you were going to tell this story during the presentation, but I feel like it needs to be mentioned there. Uh, at one point, uh, we worked together at Mandiant and uh, Security Onion was the network security monitoring solution we used to watch Mandiant. And uh, we had great success. And uh, that was due to not only the software that you were using um, that you developed, but also the operations that you put behind it. So I think, I think some people think of Mandiant like, oh, we must have had this giant security team. You know, it was basically four people on the security team. And the, the eyes on screen was essentially uh, you and Scott Runnels with a little bit of, of Derek Polson. And so uh, I think it's just a great example of if you're armed with the right kind of data and you know what you're doing, you can really defend a highly targeted enterprise thanks to that level of visibility and ease of use and just having the right kinds of, of data based on the instrumentation you have. Um, and I think that might be just a great way to start talking about that, the power of community in the, the presentation you have. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, definitely had a great time working at Mandiant. That was definitely a, a very interesting time. Uh, we faced some, a number of interesting challenges, uh, but you know, through the power of open source software and through the power of community and, and through working with others in the company and, and outside in the community, uh, I think we were able to do a, a really good job. So, you know, I really did, am a firm believer in the power of community. And so that's, uh, that's really why I titled this presentation, The Power of Community. Of course, everybody on this call is, is very well familiar with Zeke, of course. Most of you are familiar with community ID, and that's kind of that magical thing that allows you to correlate from Zeek logs to Suricata alerts or host logs or, or many different types of logs. Um, 
And so I think that was kind of a brilliant introduction uh, from the Zeek community of a way of kind of bridging from one community to another, from one data type to another, to really help to empower defenders to have better visibility and to more quickly and easily pivot from one data type to another. And ultimately it's all about finding adversaries as quickly as possible and, and kicking them out of your enterprise as quickly as possible. And, and Zeek and Community ID are absolutely uh, key in being able to do that uh, as rapidly as possible. And so really kind of the, the third piece here is, is Security Onion. And so for those who aren't familiar, let me just kind of give a, a brief introduction and overview. So Security Onion is a free and open source platform. I'm a, a huge believer in open source, as, as Richard and I kind of touched on in the beginning. Um, I built an entire career out of free and open source software. And so it was very important to me when starting a new project that we give back to that free and open source community. Uh, it just makes sense in, in many different ways. Uh, but the goal of Security Onion and, and where the name came from is we want to empower defenders to peel back the layers of your enterprise and make your adversaries cry, right? The faster we can detect those adversaries, the better we can interrupt their actions before they achieve their objectives. Uh, and ultimately, if we can bring them to justice, you know, I'd, I'd love to see some bad guys sitting in a jail cell crying their eyes out, right? Um, that's kind of the goal. But we have uh, over a million downloads of our ISO image. So we have lots and lots of security teams around the world using Security Onion today for things like threat hunting, intrusion detection, network security monitoring, enterprise security monitoring, incident response. Uh, I might even throw in the, the, the new buzzword of XDR uh, as some folks are, are kind of debating in the Twitter sphere lately. Um, but of course, you know, what's very important there is that we provide the best of breed open source tools for network visibility. And that's of course, Zeek, Snort, Suricata, and not only that, but host-based visibility as well. And uh, because as we all know, more and more of our network traffic is encrypted. So the more that we can provide visibility from the endpoints themselves uh, and put that data in context with that network data, that helps us to do our jobs uh, much more quickly and with much greater confidence. So network and endpoint visibility is really kind of key to bringing all this together. So just a very brief background, uh, Richard kind of touched a little bit about history and, and we might see a little bit of uh, the intersection of our history in, in just a minute. Uh, but the, the project began back in 2008. And uh, so I, I was really kind of looking for the best of breed open source components for intrusion detection and network security monitoring and, and really seeing folks kind of struggle with, well, I have to compile this piece of software and I have to configure it to do this and integrate it with this. And really kind of saw lots of folks in the community spend days, weeks, and sometimes months trying to get these individual pieces of software configured together uh, before they can really do the real job of defending their enterprises. And so I, I felt like we as defenders, uh, it's fundamentally unjust if we have to do all that work when our adversaries, all they have to do is download, back then it was called Backtrack Linux, now it's called Kali Linux. Uh, and there's several other kind of pre-built attacker tool sets out there. But I thought, where is the blue team equivalent of that, right? We really need as defenders, uh, a pre-built ready to go distro of the best of breed open source components and allow defenders to go fast uh, and be able to immediately stand up these systems and get immediate visibility into their enterprises. So that was the idea in 2008, uh, started working on it, put the first version out in 2009. And uh, that was actually later in that year is when we added Bro, uh, as, as it was known back then, of course. Uh, and so, you know, we've 
we've had Bro in Security Onion for almost as long as the distro has been publicly available. And it's always been a, a, a big part of the distro uh, because obviously we see the, the amazing capabilities that it brings to the table. Hey, Doug, can I interrupt you for one second here? Sure. I don't know if people appreciate this, but from the very beginning, you have been meticulous in your documentation. Like <laughs> just looking at this, it's all here. Um, since going to GitHub, uh, everything is done in a very structured manner. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about why you did that, why you think it might be important for the project? I, I think that's a great question. And, and to me, it comes down to demonstrating to the community that this is a, a serious project uh, and that it's, it's worthy of being used in an enterprise. You know, having, having been an open source fan and open source advocate for many, many years, I've seen lots and lots of open source projects, which some succeed, some fail. Uh, but if you want to be taken seriously, I think it necessitates a certain level of documentation, a certain level of communication, uh, so that you're actually telling the community what they need to know, number one, to install and configure the software, that documentation that you referred to. And number two, really what they need to do to keep it continually running, right? So when we release updates, I need to be going out there and talking to the community. And, you know, the hard part of that is that, you know, as, as a stereotypical computer nerd, right, I'm an introvert. I'm a classical introvert. And so it doesn't come naturally to me to be a great communicator. But I realize that that's something that we have to do. Uh, in order to get the word out there and to make sure that we're publicizing what's going on in the project so that folks realize that it's actively maintained, that it's continually progressing and getting better and improving. Uh, and so sometimes I feel like a spammer for the amount of uh, social media that I put out there, but I do feel that it's important to continually communicate out to our community and to our collective communities so that folks realize, you know, what we're doing and uh, that it can be taken seriously and it can be depended on uh, to continually provide results for folks in their enterprises. So I, I would just encourage anyone who's considering starting a project or perhaps they're involved with a project, take a look at the way Security Onion and Doug does all this because it's a great example to follow. And Doug, if I could just ask just a quick follow-up. Were there any projects that you looked at when you started Securing Onion and said, that's the sort of project I'd like to run? Because when I see this, it reminds me quite a bit of how the FreeBSD project is done. And yet there's many, many more people on that project compared to, especially in the early days, it was just you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I certainly, you know, I think about... Um, you know, when I started with open source software, I started with Red Hat Linux in 1997. And uh, of course, back then I was on dial up, so I wasn't able to go and download the ISO image. So I literally drove to Best Buy and purchased a copy of Red Hat Linux for 50 bucks. Um, but, you know, th so that was kind of my introduction to the world of free and open source software. And so, you know, I, I see Red Hat uh, and, you know, various Linux distros, Ubuntu, of course, included. Uh, as, you know, obviously these are Linux distributions that started as a community effort, which turned into businesses because folks felt like they could depend on them. Folks felt comfortable in deploying them in a, their enterprises. And so that was important for me to be able to do something very similar. Obviously, you know, apart from the Linux distributions themselves, the, the individual open source components, things like Bro, of course, and Suricata and Snort, uh, all three of those network components are, are very well documented uh, and you know, do a great job of communicating with their individual communities. And so I, I wanted to kind of do the same thing and mirror those efforts and try to build a community here that uh, really kind of works amongst all of those different communities, whether it's the base Linux distro itself or the the Zeek or Bro component or the Suricata component or whatever the case may be. But I think that's really kind of important is building that community and working with other communities as well, which is really what today's webinar is all about, right? Yeah, cool, thank you.
Absolutely. So that was 2009, we added Bro, and, and we've never looked back, right? That's been a huge addition to the project. Uh, and so if we fast forward then to 2011, uh, this is kind of one of the, uh, the first discussions that, that we had, as, uh, Richard and I, as, as you kind of alluded to earlier in the conversation. Um, you know, at that point, the Security Onion distro was really just a live CD. Uh, because at that point, it was still very much a hobby project for me. Uh, you know, I would get up early in the morning, I would work on Security Onion before I started my real job. And uh, all I really had time to do was build a live CD. And so folks would go and install the live CD. And, you know, it would work. But then when I released a new live CD, really the only option at that point in time is burn the system down, install the new live CD. And so when Richard reached out to me in January of 2011 and said, hey, is there any way to do an in-place upgrade? I said, man, that's going to be a lot of work. Uh, so I'm going to have to break it to him that we can't do that today. But if Richard's asking me, uh, it's probably pretty important to the future of this project that we have some sort of in-place upgrade capability. So uh, you can kind of see there the progression from January the 6th to January the 16th. Uh, I very quickly put together a uh, quick and dirty shell script, which accomplished that very first iteration of an in-place upgrade. And so now folks could, could actually deploy a system in production and they didn't have to burn it down every single time I released a new live CD. So that was uh, really a pivotal moment. So. Um, Again, uh, kudos to you, Richard. I, I appreciate that kind of input. Uh, I think, you know, if, if that hadn't been said at that moment in time, um, you know, our, our community and our project may look a whole lot different today uh, if it even existed today. So I, I certainly appreciate that suggestion at that moment in time. Well, thanks. You certainly saved me tons of time building VMs and now I could just have students you know, because you know, the students I had, they would use my VM, but it wasn't for production. It was built for a class and I wasn't intending to support it. But once Security Onion was available, I could teach them how to use it in class and then they could take it home and start using it and, and grow with it. And there's, there may even be some people today who are still using it based on that experience, you know, 10 years later. So I think it's, it's awesome that you're open to feedback like that. Very cool. Very cool. So fast forward to the next year, 2012. Um, at that point in time, of course, Security Onion being based on Ubuntu, Ubuntu had released Ubuntu 1204, and it was time to kind of rebuild the distro on top of Ubuntu 1204. And in addition, you know, this was part of the, the growing up and, and maturing of the project to really kind of take it to the next level, because since we had in-place upgrades, more and more folks were deploying it in production. And uh, because of that, it was seeing more higher levels of network traffic and things like that. And so it was important that we be able to scale beyond just one instance of Bro. And so at the time, that meant using something like PFRing as a flow-based load balancer so that we could spin up multiple Bro workers and be able to handle higher amounts of traffic. And so... Uh, in addition, you know, we kind of went from that cheesy shell script of an in-place upgrade process to real true Ubuntu packages um, packaged, uh, stored in a, in a real Ubuntu launchpad PPA, all those packages signed. So doing the right thing as far as security is concerned so that, again, folks can trust that they're getting the proper packages, they haven't been tampered with, they haven't been backdoored, those updates can be trustworthy and they can have that sense of confidence whenever they do that update that they're gonna get the proper packages and uh, everything's gonna go nice and smoothly. So that was a, a multi-month process of really kind of rebuilding every single piece of software into true Ubuntu packages, getting it all to work with PFRing but we were able to get that done before the end of the year in, in 2012. And, and that was yet another kind of pivotal moment in the growing up of the project. So we continued throughout the years uh, and, you know, through uh, continued 
tweets from, from Sir Richard uh, with his 50,000 Twitter followers or however many he has today. Um, you know, the Security Onion community continued to grow. More and more folks heard about the project and started using it. And uh, so fast forward to 2019, you know, we continued to keep up with Bro releases and uh, continue to do more and more integrations with Bro along the way. In 2019, we, we switched from PF ring to AF packet, uh, which means that we no longer have to really worry about that PF ring kernel module. AF packet is built into the Linux kernel, so just makes things nicer and smoother. And we packaged Bro 261, and along with that, included some community Bro scripts for Jaw 3 and Hash. And you all are familiar with those. Those are great bro scripts for giving that additional visibility into binaries and, and SSH connections and, and things like that in your enterprise. So again, continuing to, to pull in those community updates and, and keeping up with what's the, the best of breed components and the best practices that the community as a whole is really kind of agreeing on. Uh, could I ask you a question about that? Sure. Um, one thing we encounter on the Zeek mailing list is uh, people ask a question and it might be some, something that seems kind of obscure. And then you ask, what version are you running? And if you hear something like, well, I'm running 2.5.x or whatever, it's like, oh, wait a second. We, you know, there's security issues with that. That's really old and so forth. I think with one of the nice things about Security Onion is it makes it so easy to upgrade everything. Um, there's been several versions of that. Um, but it's, there's a, essentially, you know, a, a one line command you run and you can up, update your whole distro. Do you, like, wh how do people, like, do you find that most people are upgrading regularly or do they, do you encounter like really old editions of Security Onion still running on like the 1204 code base or whatever? You know, we, we certainly see uh, a good portion of our community really keeping pace uh, with our update process. And, you know, so we... We do our own internal testing before we release updates. Um, and, you know, so we'll see the evidence of, you know, as soon as we release a new package, we'll see folks saying, hey, I just updated to the latest version of Zeek or whatever the case may be. So we absolutely do see that uh, in many members of our community. But on the flip side of the coin, as you kind of alluded to, we, 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 we still do see other folks in the community who, for whatever reason, uh, may still be running an old, outdated version of software. Uh, and, and I'll give you a, kind of a classic example uh, because I, I know that you have prior military experience and you would appreciate this yourself. Uh, we do have folks in the military who, because of government compliance requirements, uh, they may be only authorized to run a specific version of a specific piece of software. And so sometimes we will run into that with certain folks from the military in certain units uh, that they may be running an older piece of software because that's what they were authorized to operate. Um, obviously, we're working very closely with them and trying to prod them in the right direction uh, and make sure they're running the latest and greatest software and that, that all of that stuff is authorized and um, good to go. Uh, but that's a really good question. Cool. And I'll I, have a follow-up to that, I think, after your next slide. So I want to ask about one of the changes you made, but I'll wait. Yeah, so um, in 2020, we moved to Zeek. Uh, as uh, Bro renamed to Zeek, it was time for us to package Zeek 3.0 and get that out there. And uh, so we wanted to make that process as seamless as possible, kind of getting back to your point about, you know, folks. Uh, running that soup command to install the latest Security Onion updates. We wanted to make sure that folks could do that and they wouldn't have to do a whole bunch of extra gyrations to make that work. And so we spent a lot of time making sure that we could transition somebody from bro 2.whatever to Zeek 3.0 and make that as smooth as possible. And so we released our Zeek 3.0.1 package in February of this year and follow that up in March with a Zeek 303 package. In April, we packaged and released Zeek 305. And then in May, we released uh, Zeek 306. 
So the observant among you uh, may notice there's a gap there between 301 and 303. And you may be asking why, why is there no Zeke 302? And that's really a great question. Uh, and that's, that really becomes a great story about the power of community. And so the, the story goes like this, when we released Zeke 301, and this gets back to your question, Richard, about uh, how quickly folks update, uh, it was literally a couple of days after we released our Zeke 301 package, we heard from a member of our community who had run soup on all of his production boxes, and he noticed that some of his Zeke processes were using 100% CPU. And the previous version of Bro had not done that, so this was, this was strange. This is something that he looked into, he collected some metrics, he wrote up a really good email and sent it to our mailing list, and then based on that email, we were then able to duplicate his issue in our lab. And from there, we, we said, okay, we need to kind of notify the Zeke community about this and see if we can get this resolved. And so we, we kind of nailed it down to a good reproducible test case, sent that off to the Zeke mailing list. And literally within maybe an hour or two, John Suick responded and said, let me take a look at this. He was able to reproduce it. And within a few hours had pinpointed the exact issue itself in the Zeke source code. And very quickly, uh, probably within a couple of days after that, had uh, patched it and that patch then became Zeke 303. We packaged that. We put that package out for testing, had our an original community member test it on his production boxes and confirm that that resolved the issue. And uh, so that to me really kind of speaks to the power of community, right? That's something that you just don't ever see in the world of traditional closed source software, especially if you're dealing with two different organizations, right? But because we have this open community and Zeke has this open community and we have a lot of sharing between our communities. We build this larger community and we're able to uh, work together and ultimately get things fixed uh, much, much more quickly than in the traditional world of commercial closed source software development. Yeah, I think it's, it almost reminds me of a of a hash function or you know another one way function where it's tough to say okay i have software what are all the possible things that could that could affect it negatively so i can identify them and fix them but if you end up with a situation where i know under these conditions i have a problem it's easier to go back and find it in the source code and fix it and the only way you can get to that second state is by having a community of people who will try things and then tell you when it doesn't work and thankfully that this is a great example of it. And that's exactly right. And, you know, to the point about, you know, updates we were talking about earlier, you know, I, I think it's one thing to have kind of a, a, a bug that, you know, sends the processor to 100% CPU usage. It's another thing to have an actual security issue. No software is perfect, right? Every piece of software has vulnerabilities. Zeke does a great job of, managing their uh, vulnerabilities and turning around those patches quickly. We have a really great relationship there. Uh, and, you know, when those new Zeke updates go out, we package them quickly. We get them out to the community so that folks are, are protected against whatever vulnerabilities are there. And, and likewise, you know, in, in Security Onion itself, we, we had a member of our community just last week uh, responsibly disclose a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability in Security Onion. Our software is not perfect, uh, but you know I see it as our our number one job that when a when an issue is disclosed, especially a security issue like that, we have to stop everything, we have to fix it, and we have to get the fix out there as quickly as possible. So you know for us in that particular. Uh, issue from last week, we turned that around in a matter of hours. Uh, we were notified in the morning and we had the patch out that, that afternoon. So I, I think that's um, another thing that's critically important is, is managing that turnaround time, managing the communication. And, uh, you know, like you said, we're never going to be able to find all of the bugs ourselves internally. So when a bug is found, uh, whether it's 
internally or externally, you know, that's, that's the power of community and, and managing that communication and getting the fix out there as quickly as possible. And Doug, prior to the creation of Security Onion Solutions, can you talk about how many people were involved with, with producing Security Onion? Yeah, so before starting the company, um, you know, we had, um, we had kind of a, a ragtag group of community members uh, who were kind of volunteering their own personal time. Uh, you mentioned before Scott Runnels, and, and Scott did uh, countless hours of work on the project, uh, especially back in the, the 1204 days with Elsa and, and a lot of other things. Um, and Scott was absolutely an amazing asset to the community in terms of helping the mailing list and building packages and testing things and making sure that things were working the way that they should. Um, Liam Randall was a great help uh, for many, many years uh, as a community member. We had several other folks that, you know, there's no way that I could, if I tried to go down the list, I'd inevitably forget somebody. Uh, so I, I don't want to uh, offend anybody by leaving their name out. But suffice it to say, you know, we've, we've always had an active community and, you know, the project wouldn't be what it is today if it weren't for the community. Um, I, I can't do this by myself. And, um, you know, the project wouldn't survive if it was just me. So I, I think that's, uh, again, the power of community and, you know, folks see value in the projects, folks see value in the community. So, you know, the, it, they realize the value and kind of giving back to that community. And, and so, you know, I would just, um, you know, recommend to folks, if you're not already involved in an open source project, uh, get involved, whether that's with the Zeek project itself or the Security Onion project or something else. Uh, we all kind of benefit from free and open source software in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so find a way that you can get involved. That might be through the software itself, submitting patches, uh, pull requests on GitHub. That might be documentation. That might be helping folks on mailing lists. Uh, but we can all benefit when we all kind of work together as a community. I think that's really well said. And just the thing that I've tried to do, because I'm not a developer, you know, my, my shell scripting is about as far as I can go, but uh, I was always willing to try whatever was put out there and see what it looks like and, and find out if there's any edge cases or, or whatever it is. And if you're a similar person and you just say, well, you know what, I'm just going to give this software a try and, and maybe I'll find something that is a, of use to other people. At the very least, if you don't find any bugs and someone else comes along who isn't as, as uh, familiar with the software, you can answer questions. And honestly, that's a lot, a lot of how uh, many people started. And speaking of questions, we have a few that are coming up in the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to keep my eye on them. And then I think I'm just going to have uh, or try to answer um, or have Doug answer them near the end. Um, so just keep the questions going into the Q&A and uh, we'll let Doug continue with his presentation. Awesome. So we've kind of talked about uh, network visibility. Obviously, Zeek is a huge part of that. Suricata, Snort, um, NetSniffNG for full packet capture. But we also want to integrate with endpoint technologies as well, because as we all know, more and more of our network traffic is encrypted. So we want to try to integrate with those endpoint technologies and consume those host-based logs and equip the defenders with the data that they need at their fingertips so that when they're in that heat of the moment, when they're in the, the, the battle and they're doing their incident response, they've got all the data sitting there already collected and they're not trying to scramble and, and try to go and find it. So we integrate with the, the Beats family of endpoint agents. That's things like the, uh, from the Elastic Stack, you've got WinLogB, you've got FileBeat, and several other uh, members of that Beats family. We've got Wazoo, which is a great host-based intrusion detection system. It's kind of the next generation version of OSAC, which has been around for a number of years. And that gives you log collection, log analysis, file integrity checking, rootkit detection. And um, it's cross-platform, so it's a, it's a great fit if, you, if you're a cross-platform shop. Uh, if you're looking to get really great Windows visibility, uh, if you've got a number of, of Windows machines in your shop, which most shops do, uh, of course, Sysmon gives you really great comprehensive logging of process creation and network connections and all kinds of good stuff there. Auto Runs is another member of kind of the, the Mark Rosinovich Sysinternals family. 
and it gives you good visibility into persistence mechanisms on those Windows endpoints. So we integrate with both of those great tools. And then finally, OS Query is another great cross-platform utility. Uh, so Windows, Mac OS, Linux, what have you. And it's gonna give you that log visibility. It's gonna give you that ability to query your endpoints uh, in real time. And um, again, we try to give that endpoint visibility and integrate with as many different technologies as possible. Of course, knowing that we can't integrate with every single endpoint technology that's available, but figuring out what's kind of the, the best practice and the best of breed that's out there and what's gonna give us the best bang for the buck uh, in terms of options for our community. And I feel like we're on the edge of something there with the Zeek project, with the Zeek agent that, that Seth's been working on and talked about recently. I think uh, in this coming year, we're gonna be making some more progress with that, that sort of analysis and integration. Yeah, we've been excited to kind of see the progress of that. Um, that's really exciting to see for sure. Uh, so looking forward to, to more updates that happen in the future there. Um, so once we have kind of all of these logs, whether they're coming from Zeek from a network perspective or uh, one of the other endpoint technologies, and, and that might be Zeek Agent in the future, we need a place to store those logs, right? So we look at the Elastic Stack, and we've got Log Stash consuming those logs and transporting them to Elasticsearch where they're stored. And then we as analysts, as defenders, we're going to log into Kibana as our web interface and then slice and dice those logs and do our threat hunting, do our incident response, whatever we need to do. And so a few years ago when we uh, decided to go down this path of the elastic stack, uh, we decided that, you know, it's very important to have a very comprehensive set of Kibana dashboards. So for example, uh, for Zeek, we have one dashboard for each of those main Zeek data types that uh, you all know and love. So that's the, the Zeek con log, the DNS log, the HTTP log, the SSL log. They each have their own respective dashboard. And for each of those dashboards, we kind of pull out and visualize the main fields that you would expect to see in those dashboards. And we'll typically do aggregations on those fields to show you the top 10 or the top 100 or whatever the case may be. Again, trying to really kind of give the quickest and easiest out of the box experience so that folks can stand this up. And now they've got Zeek, but they've also got a web interface so they can slice and dice those lovely Zeek logs and be able to go very quickly and find those adversaries and hunt them down. So let's talk a bit about uh, some use cases for Security Onion. Uh, now that we've talked about the architecture, now let's talk about kind of putting that architecture into uh, production. And so if you've never used Security Onion before, you might start off uh, with just creating a virtual machine and installing our Security Onion ISO image and running a command that we have called SO import PCAP. And that's going to allow you to pass one or more PCAP files. And then what SO import PCAP is going to do is it's going to run Zeek R on that PCAP and it's going to read that PCAP with Zeek and it's going to read that PCAP with Suricata. It's going to take all of those lovely Zeek logs and Suricata alerts and put them into the Elastic Stack. And so in just a few minutes, you'll be able to very quickly and easily go from a PCAP to slicing and dicing all those logs and alerts in the Elastic Stack. So you can do that in a virtual machine in just a few minutes, minimal resources. It's really quick and easy. And as a former instructor, I can't tell you how valuable this is because without it, it students would have to do a TCP replay you know, unless you provide them with a VM with everything already d built, was, which is what I would previously do, um, you simply couldn't have someone re recreate the experience with traffic, with saved traffic, without rerunning the tools individually and just having people look at stored logs. So the fact that you can do this now with, and you have been able to do it for, for several years with sec security on it is just, yeah, I hope people appreciate just what a great feature that is. <laughs> Yeah, I, I seem to remember you asking about something like that, uh, probably back in the 2012 or 2013 range. And 
And I was just thinking, man, I, I've thought about that too. I'd love to have that, but I know it's going to be a huge amount of work to get that done. Um, and so it, it took a few years to get there before we really had all the pieces, parts ready to go. Um, and it took several iterations to get it right. Uh, but it's in a place now where I feel very confident in that SO import PCAP process. And it's, it is a beautiful thing to be able to run SO import PCAP and have it import the PCAP and preserve all those original timestamps. And so you can, you know, take a PCAP from 2004 and you can look at those original timestamps uh, and it's, you know, it's just, it just works. Uh, and you're able to pivot from logs to full packet capture and everything that you would expect to do just works kind of seamlessly. So it was, it was a, a decent amount of work, but it was, it was well worth it in the end. So kind of once you've started with, with SO import PCAP and you've gotten your feet wet with Security Onion, you're kind of understanding the way that the platform works and how you would use it as a defender, you might be ready to stand it up in production. So you might start with just a standalone deployment and that's all the components running on one box. And that might be okay for a home network, a lab network, maybe a small organization if, they, if you're only trying to monitor one network segment. But if you're really trying to do an enterprise deployment, you want to do a distributed deployment. And that's where you're gonna have a master server, you're gonna have multiple forward nodes. Each of those forward nodes is running Zeek, it's running Snort or Suricata. It's doing its own full packet capture. And then all those Zeek logs and IDS alerts, those are being shipped to the master server and ultimately stored and distributed across multiple storage nodes. So building this scalable architecture that can grow as your visibility needs grow. So once you've kind of determined your use case and you're ready to actually install it, how do you do that? Well, uh, the easiest way is go to securityonion.net. You download our ISO image. It's already been downloaded over a million times, being used around the world. Um, or uh, if you want to use your own preferred flavor of Ubuntu 16.04, you can do that and then install our components on top of that. Works just fine either way. Uh, we actually do have another option now, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So once you've got kind of Security Onion up and running, uh, you might be interested in some other community projects which uh, pair nicely with Security Onion. Uh, and so one of these is Sigma. Uh, if you haven't heard of Sigma, you might think of, you know, if you're familiar with snort rules, you write a rule to detect a, a kind, certain pattern in your network traffic. Sigma is kind of the same way, but it's for looking for specific patterns in logs in your SIM. Uh, and that might be Elasticsearch in our case. And this got really even that much better uh, just within the past couple of weeks because Nate over at SOC Prime uh, committed a pull request to the Sigma repo uh, to fully support Zeek logs. Uh, and so you can now envision sort of writing a Sigma rule that's gonna run against Elasticsearch and look for specific patterns in your Zeek logs. Uh, so that's really pretty powerful technology. Excited to see that unfold. The next piece that you might be interested in is Playbook. Uh, so what Playbook does is it enables you to then pull in those Sigma rules and then look at the Sigma rules that are available to you, selectively enable certain rules if you want to. And then once they're enabled, they're going to run Elastalert on a periodic basis. It's going to query Elasticsearch. And if any uh, detections are made, then it generates those alerts. And you might then have those alerts go into something like the Hive. Hive is a, a great web interface for incident management, case management. Um, stand up the Hive and your security operations center now has a place to put their alerts and turn those alerts into cases and really store all of their indicators, all of their case notes, and ultimately close those cases as they are uh, making those adversaries cry and kicking them out of their networks. What you see in the screenshot is actually a uh, Sigma rule 
for some sysmon activity, right? So you start to see how all these pieces come together, right? Where you could have sigma looking for some sysmon activity or some Zeek activity, and it's generating alerts that are going into the hive, and you can then pivot from the hive into Elasticsearch to do further investigation, go back into the hive to kind of complete your investigation and close the case. So you start to see how all these pieces fit together. And then to take that to the next level, we talked about OS query before. If you're deploying that, uh, you might want a way to manage that OS query deployment, and that's where Fleet comes into play. And so you might use Fleet to help in your, your kind of incident response cycles if you're needing to do some live response, some eradication, or, or querying some hosts uh, on an ad hoc basis. Fleet's going to help you do that kind of stuff. So now you could take our existing security on your platform. You could then stand up those individual components alongside it, or this is what I was alluding to earlier, you could download our new Security Onion Hybrid Hunter platform, which has all of that stuff baked into it from the beginning, right? So just like back in 2008, we kind of set out to build this platform that had Snort, Suricata, Bro, and other things. Uh, now we're building on top of that and adding in all of the, the extra stuff that you need for kind of pulling in those Sigma rules and managing those Sigma rules and dealing with those alerts that come out of those Sigma rules and turning those into cases and working those cases and so on and so forth. So Security Onion Hybrid Hunter is really the, the code name for the next major version of Security Onion that's currently in beta. We just released beta two recently. And so just like we did back in 2012, when we kind of rebuilt the distro from the ground up, we're doing that again. Uh, this time, instead of building everything in Ubuntu packages, we're building it in containers uh, because it's now time to no longer be limited to just Ubuntu. Uh, we want to be able to support things like CentOS and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So in Security Onion Hybrid Hunter, everything is a container. Those containers are managed with salt stack. And that salt stack orchestration supports out of the box CentOS 7 and Ubuntu 18.04. So you can go and download Security Onion Hybrid Hunter today. You can download our ISO image that's based on CentOS 7, or you can install your own version of CentOS 7, install your own version of Ubuntu 18.04, run the setup script. It downloads the containers and gets everything set up for you. And uh, in addition to all of those other components that we added, we also built our own web interface for threat hunting. And so this is a, a brand new web interface that's going to query the Elasticsearch backend. And it's designed to be fast and it's designed to give you some really great query capabilities. Um, and so we'll actually see this in the demo in a little while, but uh, a brief synops synopsis would be You've got your query up here. You've got your time range here. We're going to show you some quick visualizations up top. So most occurrences that might be top 10 or top 100, uh, a little bit of an event timeline and then fewest occurrences. So we're going to look for kind of the, the big spikes here and then the long tail here. And then we're going to give you your group by capability here. We're just grouping by a single field uh, highest registered domain. And so uh, in this case, we're actually taking our Zeek DNS logs and we're grouping by DNS.highest registered domain. So we take off the dub, dub, dub or any other parts of the domain. We just get down to the, the domain name itself. And then you could start excluding things like google.com and microsoft.com and really start looking for those anomalies in your DNS traffic. Uh, and then below the group by table, we have the events table at the very end and that's where the full events can be found. Each of these entries, you can click the down arrow to drill into it and see all of those lovely Zeek fields that we all know and love. And uh, what makes us even better is we can now do multiple group buys as well. So in the previous example, we were grouping by a single field. Here we're actually grouping by four fields, source IP, destination IP, network protocol and destination port. And you can filter on these things. You can kind of change your group buys uh, very quickly and easily. So it becomes really kind of a, a great hunting tool. 
Now this is where, where we really start to tie things together and things get really more interesting. Um, so going back to community ID, we've talked about in the beginning, uh, in Hybrid Hunter, we are enabling the native community ID support in Zeek. So here you see in our new hunting web interface, we take all of our Zeek logs and we group by community ID. And there you see some examples of that there. And we do the same thing with Suricata. We enable that by default. So we could search for all of our Suricata alerts grouped by that uh, community ID. You see a bunch of those there. Now we can then tie that into even more things, right? Because community ID can tie not just Zeek and Suricata alerts together, uh, but you could tie to things like OS query. So uh, we, we saw this as uh, a capability that would be nice in OS query. So we sponsored the development of community ID support there. So if you have OS query deployed in your enterprise, and let's say you're looking at your Zeek logs, your Suricata alerts, you see some interesting network traffic and you wanna trace that back to a host, you then go into OS query, you run a query like this, which is gonna look for that community ID. And then OS query can look across your fleet and tell you that it's here on this host and the binary is netcat. So you've got a netcat listener that created that traffic that you found using your Zeek logs, right? So that's, that's a brilliant way of kind of tying together the network side and the host side and uh, making us that much more effective and efficient as defenders. Now, it gets even better, right? Because what about if there's a, a tool that we can't just go and um, submit a pull request to? For example, Sysmon. Uh, there's actually a feature request out there on the Sysmon repo asking for community ID support. They've added it to their backlog, so they want to add that as a feature, but I don't believe they've done that yet. Uh, and of course, Sysmon is a Microsoft um, piece of code, so we, we can't just go and, and fix that ourselves. And there's several other examples of that. So we said, well, you know, what if we create a, a way that as logs are coming into Elasticsearch, we can create that community ID on the fly. So that's exactly what we did. We sponsored the development of an Elasticsearch ingest processor so that all those logs coming in, we can go ahead and generate that community ID on the fly, even if the native tool doesn't support it out of the box. So that literally just happened in the past week or so, um, and we expect to fully integrate that in the next version of Hybrid Hunter. That's cool and creative too. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's um, everything we do, we kind of do out of necessity, right? Because we, we, see, we see problems and we try to come up with solutions. And, um, you know, so we, we will try this thing and we'll hopefully it will help the community and uh, we'll see how it goes. Hey, Doug, so, can, I, can I try asking a couple of questions before the demo? Sure. Uh, uh, let's see. So is SO import available on Hybrid Hunter? Uh, very good question. Uh, so we do not have SO import PCAP available in Hybrid Hunter yet, uh, but it is on the roadmap. It is something we know that we need to get done. Uh, but it is a, as I mentioned before, it's a pretty complicated thing. Yeah. Um, and so to recreate that in Hybrid Hunter, it's going to take us some more time. We will get there, um, but it's not there yet. Okay. Here's another one. Maybe I'm asking all the hard ones up front. Um, Bring it on. An, <laughs> is there an upgrade path from 16.04 to 18, or is it a full rebuild? So we have an open issue for that in our Hybrid Hunter repo. Uh, we, we do want to have a supported upgrade path um, that, that will take some doing, right? Because you'll have to upgrade from Ubuntu 16.04 to Ubuntu 18.04, and then you'll have to kind of upgrade to the Hybrid Hunter components but we want to at least have some sort of a documented procedure and hopefully some tooling around that to, to make it as automated as possible. We may not be able to fully streamline the experience, uh, but we do want to be able to support that as much as possible. And is there a Red Hat version of, of Hybrid Hunter? Yes. So Hybrid Hunter uh, out of the box works on CentOS 7, uh, which means that we should be able to make it work on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. We haven't fully tested that, but 
since CentOS and Red Hat Enterprise Linux are 90 something percent compatible, uh, it should be a, a fairly trivial matter to get that going. Okay. Um, how do I send logs securely over the internet in a distributed environment aside from using a point to point VPN? Okay, so if you're in a distributed environment, uh, you have Security Onion sensors, which are reporting to a Security Onion master server. If you're talking about our current 1604 platform, all of that communication from the sensor to the master server is encrypted using an SSH tunnel, right? So whether you're on a private network or you're on a VPN, or even if you're on the public internet, uh, all of that communication goes over an SSH tunnel and is encrypted. Uh, and there are similar things in place for Hybrid Hunter. Uh, we still have some changes to make uh, along the way, but uh, that's something that we want to make sure that we have some answers for. Okay. Um, let's see. Using more recent versions of Elastic Stack, are you relying heavily on BEAT modules to conform with Elastic Common Schema, or have you or are you adopting a different schema or data model? Very good question. So in Hybrid Hunter, we are in the process right now of converting everything over to Elastic Common Schema. Uh, we, we see that as yet another way of kind of building community and you know, kind of aligning with the Elastic community. They've kind of established this as the standard amongst all the individual communities. And so it makes sense for us to align with that and to try to be interoperable with other tools and other technologies uh, and so we absolutely are. We've, we've started that process of aligning with ECS. We, we started that in beta one of Hybrid Hunter. We improved that in beta two. And I think we have a little bit more cleanup work to do in beta three, but um, it, it's actually going very well. Okay. There's a question here. And I, <laughs> uh, the question is, when is Hybrid Hunter going to be GA? My guess would be before you answer, usually tie the big things to security onion con uh, or uh, yeah. So my guess would be in the fall, but maybe you have another answer. Dang it, Richard, you spoiled the big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so your, your insight and intuition serves you well. Uh, we are hoping to do a release later this year. Of course, we we're not making any promises at this point in time. We still have a lot of work to do. Uh, but we would like to be able to release that this fall. Um, but part of that is going to depend on feedback from the community, right? Uh, because we are, we, we are big believers in release early and release often. And that's why we went through technology previews and alpha one and alpha two and alpha three. And now we're into beta one and beta two. We'll do a beta three and then we'll go through release candidates. Um, and, and all of that is getting the community to try it out getting the feedback and incorporating that feedback uh, as early on in the process as possible. So the more folks we get trying it and the more feedback we get, the more likely we are to be able to be at a point where we feel comfortable in releasing that final version. Yeah, that's a good answer. I think that's a, a great way to encourage people to participate. The more people that are out there trying it, the more feedback will come in and the better you'll feel about whatever it is you want to release. So. Yeah, so it's a good call to action for our audience to stay involved. Um, there's a couple of other questions, but they're kind of uh, some of them a little bit of a niche. So we're, we're down to about a minute left, Doug. Is there anything you would like to, to leave with the audience? Well, um, I was hoping to uh, do a demo, but I don't think that will quite fit into a minute. Um, I, I definitely want to say thank you to, you know, the entire Zeke community for number one, being an awesome community for being an awesome project. Um, it's definitely been a game changer for security onion and for our entire community. Uh, I know that it makes uh, the lives of defenders much, much better provides uh, much better visibility than, than folks have previously seen and enables them to go faster and to catch more bad guys. Uh, than they would have previously. So I'm uh, tremendously grateful for uh, the Zeke project and for the Zeke community and uh, just looking forward to more and more uh, working together in the future. Uh, and that's kind of my, my last slide here. Um, working together as a community and making our adversaries cry. You know, that's, 
uh, at the end of the day, that's what I want to do is, um, you know, work together across all these communities and um, build our defenders to the point where adversaries are scared to try to come into our networks. Uh, so let's, um, let's keep on working together and, and build up the best defenders that we've ever seen. Well said, Doug. It r reminds me of what Rob Joyce said when, when he was working up at the fort about the worst nightmare for the offensive teams they had there was going against uh, a target that had a network sensor that was keeping track of everything that was going on. And uh, guess what? That's what, uh, that's what we do with all the software. So as long as people are out there trying it and learning how to use it, they're going to make uh, the lives of the bad guys difficult. So thank you so much for, for joining us today and speaking so eloqu eloquently as always uh, about your project. And uh, thank you to all the listeners. I believe we'll make um, the recording of this available because we filled uh, the, the channel to capacity and many people weren't allowed to join. Um, so we're going to do our best to make the recording available so people who couldn't watch it live could do that. And uh, thank you so much. And thanks again, Doug, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.